Surgeon has developed, refined, and applied Amplitex PCR chemistry to amplify the unamplifiable, beginning with FMR1 repeat expansions and extending to other challenging genes such as SMN1, SMN2, and CFTR. So what happens when you integrate a technology that can amplify the unamplifiable with one that can sequence the unsequenceable? You provide a novel approach that can realize the diagnostic potential of genes and biomarkers that defy even the best current methods. Hello and welcome. My name is Gary Latham, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Research and Development at Assurigen, a molecular diagnostics company in Austin, Texas. I have a longstanding interest in nucleic acid technology and test development, and appreciate the invitation to present our recent work, Long Range PCR Meets Long Read Sequencing. So today, I'm going to talk about what we've missed in the genome, so-called dark DNA sequences that have evaded conventional sequencing or characterization, or when they have known clinical implications, uh, lack routine in comprehensive molecular diagnostic analysis. Historically, I, th I think what we've been missing is due at least in part to the streetlight effect, you know, where the guy goes looking for his lost keys under the streetlight because, well, that's where the light is. Over the past several decades, the streetlight for genomic variation has included beacons of technologies such as high density arrays and Sanger sequencing and next generation sequencing. But the light they cast reaches only so far and many structural variants with important and common disease consequences have been left in the dark. But that's rapidly changing. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about two problems for translating clinically dark DNA to actionable information in the context of one application, carrier screening. And then I want to propose a solution that integrates two fundamentally different technologies for how to do this in a way that can provide more and better information. These technologies and their combination remind me of a quote by the science fiction writer William Gibson, who said, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So in this talk, I wanna bring the future to the foreground of the present. But first, let me set the stage. And the stage here is the human genome. Now we declared victory in sequencing the human genome back in 2001, but the reality is that this was a first draft. About 10% of the sequence was missing. And over the years, we filled gaps such that the latest formal human genome reference, GRCH38, has about 5% missing sequence. So what is that sequence? Well, much of it's repeat DNA. And one of the surprising things about the human genome is that half of it is comprised of repetitive sequence. This problem is that conventional short read sequencing and standard bioinformatic pipelines tend to gloss over repetitive DNA because they don't include the flanking sequences and they can't map them. But long read sequencing technologies can capture these repeats within the context of their flanking regions and fill in the gaps. And this, in turn, can help drive an understanding of function and potentially uh, broader clinical applications. You know, this potential is exemplified by the very recent announcement of the version 1.0 assembly by the Telomere to Telomere Consortium. This assembly adds more than 100 megabase pairs of novel sequence. It helps fill in some key blanks for us. It helps illuminate new complex regions for study. And it was achieved by using a combination of sequencing technologies, but a primary contributor was PacBio HiFi sequencing. And the figure here shows a bandage visualization of the HiFi string graph for the essentially haploid CHM13 genome. You can see there's very few knots and tangles, and that's consistent with most of the chromosomes being fully resolved. But just because we can extract the sequence of a given region doesn't mean that these regions can be routinely sequenced and resolved. And as an example of that, consider the following. So in this work, using short read sequencing, the study here found nearly 37,000 dark regions in 6,000 genes involved in pathways ranging from human health to development to reproduction. And one example is SMN1, which causes spinal muscular atrophy and is a critical gene for carrier screening and assessing the risk of um, reproductive risk for couples. And you can see the gaps in the sequence that's shown here, and that's due to the exceedingly high sequence similarity between SMN1 and its paralog 
SMN2. But SMN1 is hardly the only gene that's relevant to carrier screening that has dark regions, and several other high prevalence carrier genes, as shown here below, also harbor dark DNA. Now, as I said at the outset, we have two problems. First problem is how do we enrich for the targets of interest? And the second problem is how do we sequence those enriched regions? And ultimately, how can we put those together in the right workflow, in a unified workflow, that can accommodate high and low throughput use cases? So let's tackle the second problem, how do we sequence, first. We know that short read sequencing can't readily resolve many tough sequences that are important in the clinic, like carrier genes. But as we saw earlier in the success of the T2T -T consortium, long read sequencing can reconcile gaps that may be left behind by next generation sequencing. The study I mentioned on dark genes that were left behind also showed the promise of long read sequencing. So in this case, PacBio sequencing resolved DNA in SMN1 that was 94% camouflaged due to the highly similar SMN2 gene. But when PacBio sequencing was used, that number dropped to 0% that was camouflaged. Another example is the gene CR1. This is a risk gene for Alzheimer's disease, and it's cloaked by a repeat sequence that lies within its own sequence. And as a result, CR1 was 26% camouflaged based on Illumina 100 base pair reads. But like SMN1 and 2, it was fully resolved using PacBio sequencing. So what these results show us is that long read sequencing can stretch across ambiguous loci. It can provide contiguity for hard to sequence regions, including homologous sequences and repeat sequences in clinically important genes. And this approach can address our second problem, which is that sequencing problem. Now, how about the first problem, the enrichment problem? Well, in this case, we can turn to a novel approach, a different technology that's been well-established for molecular diagnostic testing for tough genes. This is an approach that we call Ampledex PCR. So what's that? It's a novel chemistry that can amplify sequences that defy traditional PCR. And we developed it specifically to genotype CGG triplet repeat expansions in the FMR1 gene. Why? Because at the time, no PCR was able to reliably navigate that region. And this was 20 years after the repeat expansion was discovered and characterized. This is important because these repeat expansions cause fragile X syndrome, which is the most common known genetic cause of autism as well as other disorders. So after we developed this long range PCR, we applied it to repeat sizing. We then used it to assess the methylation of the FMR1 gene, which is important to confirm gene silencing. We applied it to other tough targets like the hexanucleotide repeat expansion in C9 or 72. And more recently, we've extended it to include CNVs, single nucleotide variants, indels, and SMN1 and 2. And our current focus is using the technology to detect the full range of targeted variants in CFTR, which causes cystic fibrosis. So as a result, this approach, this long-range PCR, offers a broad runway for us to enrich for targets that can be further analyzed using any one of a number of different instrument platforms. But to give you a, a picture of of how this PCR works, I'm gonna put a spotlight on how we use Ampledex PCR in Fragile X and reading it out by capillary electrophoresis. Now the challenge here is that the triplet repeat region, uh, the CGG repeat, is essentially 100% GC character. So even lab protocols that were developed specifically to amplify this repeat have been limited to 50 to 100 repeats or so. This is a crippling limitation since premutation carriers have at least 55 repeats and those with Fragile X have 200 or more. So PCRs typically conk out before they can even cover these regions. So as a result, we needed a better PCR. We needed a PCR that wasn't going to choke on these repeats. Ampledex PCR by comparison has been developed to reliably amplify alleles up to at least 1300 repeats. And it's been reported by our, our lab, as well as many others through different publications over the years. To date, there's over 100 publications that have reported data using the chemistry. It has become the gold standard for fragile X gene characterization. So let's put all this together. PacBio likes to say that if you can amplify it, then we can sequence it. And in Assurgen, we like to say, well, if you can analyze the amplicons, then we can amplify the targets. So naturally, we believe that the union of these two technologies can help operationalize tough targets in the genome for routine analysis. This is our solution to the two problems that I noted, noted earlier. To integrate long range diagnostic PCR with a high quality long read sequencing approach and capitalize on the best of both.
by creating a unified workflow that can accurately and comprehensively illuminate clinical dark genes. And we anticipate that the convergence of the right wetware, hardware, and software will provide more and better information for such genes. Now, as a clinical application for this union of technologies, we chose carrier screening. Okay, so why did we pick that? Well, first, carrier screening has clinical validity and utility to help couples make more informed reproductive decisions, such as pursuing prenatal diagnosis or IVF. An important trend is that carrier screening is increasingly shifting from one gene at a time, like looking at just CFTR or SMN1 or FMR1, to whole panels of genes. And screening for the right combination of carrier genes is important because about 80% of children that are born with a genetic disease have no family history. Now there's an ongoing debate about what the right panel of carrier genes should be, but this chart includes genes that are particularly well justified. These are the top 10 carrier genes by risk to couples. This risk considers the multiplicative across partners for autosomal recessive disorders, as well as the risk borne by X-linked disorders like for Fragile X, DMD, and Hemophilia A. Now, although the current method to screen panels of carrier genes is NGS, there's a problem. And the problem is inherent to several of the most prevalent carrier genes. They are either really hard or challenging or simply intractable by short read sequencing. For example, FMR1 is plagued by GC-rich repeat expansions. HBA1 and 2, DMD, CYP21A2, and SMN1 are beset by problematic CNVs. And several of these genes, including factor eight, have other complex structural variants or paralogs or pseudogenes that can map to multiple genomic regions. The problems that I'm describing here aren't new. They're well-documented as shown by several different publications, some of which are captured here. And although some of these tough targets can be partially addressed using bespoke bioinformatic pipelines or very generous reflexes to non-NGS assays, we think there's a better way. And the better way is to link Ampledex long-range PCR and PacBio long-read sequencing. Now, our collaboration with PacBio on this front has begun only recently, but I'm excited to show you some early data. And I'll do so across several of the challenging genes that I just alluded to, FMR1, SMN1, TIP21A2, and Factor 8 So let's start with FMR1. Now I mentioned that FMR1 was important for carrier screening because of the expansion of the CGG repeat. If it's beyond 55 repeats, then one is a premutation carrier and has a risk of that repeat expanding further in the next generation. One other factor that's important to consider within that risk is AGG interruptions within the CGG repeat tract. So these are stability anchors, and when they occur within the repeat tract, they tend to reduce the risk of expansion in that next generation. So ideally, we want to look at the number of CGGs, where a carrier is between 55 and, and typically 90 or so for risk that can map to expansion, but also consider the AGG interruption status. The way that we typically do this is that we amplify the repeat sequence using long-range PCR. We have longer stretches that are amplified using those flanking primers, then that's associated with having more repeats. And then we can size those by capillary electrophoresis. This is an example of a non-carrier. It's a female that has 30 and 32 repeats on her two X chromosomes. And you can see the two primary peaks from the electropherogram here that shows you uh, what would correspond to the 30 CGG allele and the 32 CGG allele. And we can overlay that with the same chemistry, but now reading it out by using smart sequencing. And you get a very similar trace, 30 and 32 as a peak for the pileups associated with the reads for those two alleles. You can further dive into a waterfall plot and you can see a couple of key features here. You see the, the distribution across the two alleles with 30 and 32 total repeats, but you can also see those orange bands those are the AGG interruptions. So they map out at very specific positions. And in this case, we have two AGGs for each of the alleles. What about actual carrier samples, those that have premutations? Shown here is a premutation female. It has one allele with 30 repeats and one with 56. As I showed you before, this is the fragment analysis from capillary electrophoresis. And you can see the peaks associated with those two alleles. 
I'll overlay the smart sequencing here. You can see that it looks very reminiscent of the capillary electrophoresis pattern. And then the waterfall plot gives you additional information because it tells you not only that you have these two groupings of 30 and 56, but you also have the AGG status. Two AGG interruptions in the normal allele and one AGG in the premutation allele of 56. This particular allele would have an extraordinarily low chance of expanding the next generation because it is a small premutation and it has an AGG, which again stabilizes that particular region. Now in contrast, consider if a premutation female it has 30 and 80 repeats. Capillary electrophoresis profile is shown here, the corresponding smart sequencing result, and the waterfall plot. Now in this case, the 80 repeat allele has no AGG interruptions, and this would be at a high risk for expansion. And just to give you a sense of how the risk profile changes as a function of AGG, an 80 repeat allele with no AGGs has more than an 80% chance of expanding in the next generation if it's inherited, but one that had one AGG, for example, would have only about a 50% chance. If we then extend that to an even more edge case scenario with full mutation expansions, this is a full mutation female. You can see we have both alleles 20 and 200 represented in the electropherogram and in the corresponding smart sequencing result. And the waterfall plot nicely shows you cells and even the AGG status with two AGG interruptions in the full mutation allele. And then an even more challenging sample, a female with 28 and 335 repeats. We can flag the 335 and, and genotype the 28. And you can see the corresponding waterfall plot. So we have tremendous promise here in how we can take this chemistry, which has been able to reliably amplify these really long GC rich repeats and now read it out on a, a smart sequencing uh, instrument. So now let's look at SMN1 and its paralog SMN2. So homozygous loss of function in SMN1 causes SMA and it is a devastating disorder that is or was the most common genetic cause of, of infant death. And I'll say was because I'm not sure that's true anymore, given the extraordinary breakthrough therapies that have been available to, to patients in just the last few years, like Spinraza and Zolgensma and Everisd. Um, and thousands of children have been successfully treated with these drugs. Now, SMA carriers are, are pretty common, about one in 40 to 60 in the population. And carriers can have one of, of several different types of SMN1 variants. 70 to 95% of carriers have an exon 7 deletion, depending on their uh, racial and ethnic background. A small fraction may have a disabling SNV instead of an exon deletion. But there's another wrinkle here. And that wrinkle is that SMA carriers may also be silent, which means they have two copies of a functional SMM1 on one allele, but no copy on the other. And since current assays simply count the number of SMN1 exon 7 copies, a copy number of two can be misinterpreted as a non-carrier when the individual may actually be a silent carrier. Now, importantly, gene duplication markers have been identified that can be used to flag silent carriers and, and thus improve residual risk estimates. So our approach was consolidate all this information and use long-range PCR to amplify SMN1 and 2 using smart sequencing to analyze the amplicons. And here's an example of data for HG001 from the genome in the bottle consortium. This sample has two SMN1 copies and two SMN2 copies. You can see the SMN2 specific, paralog specific variants and SNPs in gray compared to the SMN1 that's shown in blue. This level of comparison is only possible due to long amplicons and long read links that are captured uh, or able to capture the rare differences between SMN1 and its very similar paralog in SMN2. And these two genes are only separated by a handful of nucleotides. So it's really critical to be able to, to grab these um, markers where you can. So when we compare this sample with others, we can see additional distinctions between the two genes. For example, uh, this sample S5 has four copies of SMN1. Two SMN1 copies have different SNVs that are borrowed from SMN2, probably reflecting gene conversion event. And two copies also have the telltale silent carrier variants. Casting a broader net, here's a panel of 10 samples that span zero to four copies of both SMN1 and 2. And in each case, we can make the right copy number call, even as we detect silent carrier variants and gene conversion events. Now, these are early stage data, but we do believe the approach has a high ceiling to be able to resolve both conventional and unconventional variants in SMA carriers. The next gene I'd like to double click on is CYP21A2. So this gene causes congenital adrenal hyperplasia. 
has a carrier prevalence of about 1 in 60. Unambiguously determining the pathogenic variants in CYP21A2 is really hard uh, for several reasons. CYP21A2 has an upstream pseudogene, cyp 21 a1P that's 98% identical in sequence. Uh, Paralog-specific variants are non-uniformly distributed and are variably conserved. And as a result, we have to tell these two genes apart, and there are multiple ways by which pathogenic events can arise, such as uh, from gene conversions from one gene to the next, from other SNVs, as shown by the red bar here, or from large deletions that can occur that can generate fusions between the two genes. Now, on top of all that, both the gene and the pseudogene have variable copy number. So how can we resolve all these complex events? Well, the approach again was to use Amplex PCR to simultaneously enrich for the gene and the pseudogene and deconvolute the different alleles using PSVs following smart sequencing. So this particular data example, also for HG001, shows three total CYP21 copies, or more specifically, two copies of the gene and a single copy of the pseudogene. Also shown here is the germline polymorphism, which is the band in light red shown in the figure that's not specific to either paralog. And I highlight this just to underscore the challenge of utilizing reliable landmarks to differentiate the gene and the pseudogene. Now, in this trio, we have an example of two carriers where we're able to correctly identify a whole gene deletion in the mother, S1, and a 30KB deletion in the father, S2, that results in a fusion of the pseudogene and the gene. And so our analysis, the proband, S3, shown at the bottom, correctly identifies both pathogenic alleles inherited from the parents. We're in the process of extending our analyses to additional samples. And with that in mind, here's a snapshot of some of the more interesting cases from a group of 20 samples. These include whole gene and partial gene deletions and gene conversions and combinations therein, along with accurate determination of the copy numbers of the gene and the pseudogene from two to five copies. So I'll wrap up with one of the most complex of carrier genes, the X-linked gene factor eight. Uh, nearly half of severe hemophilia A cases are caused by uh, intron 22 inversions, which split the gene into two parts. A key challenge here is that the sequences involved in this inversion, which are known as H1, H2, and H3 as shown, are highly homologous. In fact, there's fewer than a dozen PSVs, and they're also non-uniformly distributed across about 10 KB of shared sequence. This is further complicated by the fact that there are tracks that are very GC rich. You can see the inset here. This is a 1KB stretch that has anywhere from 80 to 90% GC rich sequence. And so our approach is to be able to use long range PCR to be uh, able to nab about 10KB plus uh, regions that are adorned with milestones that we can differentiate H1 from H2 and H3 following smart sequencing. And this strategy allows us then to visualize the different combinations of genes and homologous sequence and uh, reconstruct the complex pathogenic events. To give you a picture of what this looks like, let's compare a normal female with an affected male. So in this slide, we see H1 and H2 and 3 as expected for the non-carrier female S1 on the left. On the right, in the affected male, S2, we detect no intron 22H1, but we do detect H2 as expected, given the unaffected single copy in this region. But we also detect an inversion through the effusion of H1 and H3, and the predictive breakpoint, which is shown in red there, was determined by observing the transition point between H1 and H3 using PSVs. We also, by the way, detected the reciprocal amplicon, H2, H3, with H1, in the corresponding reads, which adds confirmation to the result. So to conclude, we've combined two technologies, one that faithfully elevates clinical content from the genome, and the other, which resolves it, into a single platform workflow that can address some of the toughest genes for carrier screening. We're enthusiastic about how this approach can address a real-world gaps in genetic screening and diagnosis and scale across the spectrum of applications, so our goal is gonna to be to optimize this workflow, uh, integrate the pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical phases, and create a diagnostic system of wetware, hardware, and software for reproductive health and for other applications. And we look forward to fit for purpose improvements in the underlying technologies and their verification and validation with large sample cohorts. So thank you. Thank you for your time today.
And I welcome any questions you may have either within this venue or offline. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm here with uh, Gary Latham, who's the Senior Vice President of R&D at Assurigen. Uh, my name is Nick Cisneros. I'm the Senior Director um, of the Field Application Scientist team here at PacBio, and you are joining us on our live Q&A. Um, if you could, please go ahead and uh, enter any questions that you have uh, in the chat window here, and I'll be sure to get those asked right away. Um, currently, I have a couple of questions already, um, Gary, for you. Uh, what are the CGG allele upper and lower size limit that can be detected by the Amplidex and PacBio combination? Yeah, so it's a great question. So one of those is defined by biological limits. And we know that the low end is around five CGGs and the upper end has been reported to be as high as about 2000. And what we've tested with uh, the combination of the Amplidex PCR with the SQL system is going out to several hundred repeats. I think the highest we've tested so far has been in the range of around 335, but we have literally thousands of samples and uh, many, many full mutations that we can further stress with the system. So we, we don't think we've hit that limit. As I mentioned in the presentation, the PCR can manage CGG numbers uh, up to at least 1300. And we believe that that can relay across to a readout on smart sequencing because it has the capacity to deal with the challenge of those repeats and longer amplicons. So we don't know exactly what the upper limit is. What we do know is that it is fit for purpose for a clinical application because the clinical threshold is at 200. So we believe that there's plenty of runway to be able to serve the target application. Sure, sure, that makes sense. Um, next question uh, came, comes from David Nelson. Uh, does the FMR1 risk to couples in your carrier screen include premutation disorders? Yeah, so what we were looking at with uh, the mapping of that risk is uh, against the um, potential for expansion to a, a full mutation. So, of course, there are premutation disorders that Dr. Nelson is all too aware, and uh, those will add to that total risk. But as we were doing that calculation, we're looking at essentially the risk of a mom who's going to pass on an expanded allele to the child, which if inherited, uh, runs in the range of about one in 200. And as a consequence, that's what we're factoring into those risk estimates. But there are uh, other uh, disorders that are associated with fragile X that are very important to consider. And that's just part of the larger equation. Sure. And uh, I got another question related to that about, that says, how about C9 um, or 72 repeat expansions? Yeah, so that was something that we looked at early on in this process and even had an, an earlier collaboration with PacBio to address. And the PCR has the capacity to be able to amplify through those hexanucleotide repeats. Uh, we can amplify up to close to 1,000 in that case. We published a paper a couple of years ago going up to 950 altogether. And in the early evaluation that we did with PacBio before we endeavored this larger scale study with looking at carrier genes, we were able to show we could get into the 120 plus range for repeats, but it was just a drop in the water. It was a way to take an initial look at the capacity to be able to amplify that target. Certainly it's a tough one. Uh, one of the very toughest ones that's in the genome, but we see a utility around the repeat in that range as well for applications that are important for uh, neurodegenerative disorders. Sure. Okay, we have time for uh, probably one more, one more question here. Um, have you looked at using this strategy for DM1 slash DM2? Yeah, so we're considering all possibilities of how the different repeat disorders might be managed through this type of workflow and approach. And we do have a PCRCE based technology and kit for looking at myotonic dystrophy. And we haven't looked at that explicitly in this workflow, but I have every confidence that our ability to amplify those repeats, which we can read out on a fragment analyzer on a capillary electrophoresis can be equally well or better read out using a smart sequencer. So I don't see a problem on the front end because we've already solved that. And I don't see a problem on the back end based on the data we've already generated using smart sequencing. Okay, perfect. So we have quite a few questions here that are left unanswered. Um, unfortunately, we're kind of out of time here. Um, those of you that have asked questions, uh, we will uh, follow up and get you an answer to those questions here. 
um, at the end of this recording. Gary, thank you for your recording and your, and your presentation. It was really great. And thank you for your time and joining us in the Q&A today. Absolutely. Thank you, Nick. And thanks to PagBio for the collaboration. Look forward to the great work we can do together. Indeed. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a good rest of the day.